Hey, greetings, friends. Jacques Howard here, and welcome to Trenton 365. But during this segment, I'm going to be making lots of references to lots of different media things and outlets that are happening. But most importantly, I want to thank you for your time, for spending any of it with uh, me and with my guests. And the guest that I'm going to be bringing on shortly is Vini. Deanie Stansberry of WIMG 1300. And we're going to be talking about healthcare, um, about healthcare from the standpoint of, hey, how important is this to us really? And if it is, what steps are we taking to make sure that we're taking care of ourselves so that we can be here for our loved ones? So without any further ado, and while I get rid of this froggy in my throat, I'm going to bring on the lovely, talented, beautiful, and the station manager of WIMG 1300. Beanie, jump on for a little bit while I clear my throat and introduce yourself. That is a song. Let me clear my throat. <laughs> 1300. Oh, look, I'm so everything WIMG. But I am Beanie Stansberry. I've been working at WIMG for close to 20 years. I am um, um, this month, actually, will begin my 20th year. So. I've been there for a little while. I think Maggie and Steve are the only two that's been there longer than I have. Uh, I've been an office manager now for 12 years. I became the office manager again in August. In August of 2010, I became the office manager. And I, through that, I have seen a lot, uh, especially with healthcare. I think this pandemic, has made me more health conscious. Um, but before that, it was the passing of my mother that made me really say, you got to start taking care of yourself. If you can see there's a painting on the wall, that's a painting of my mother. I, it took my grandchildren some time to realize that that wasn't me. They were like, that's you, my mom. No, honey, that's my mom. But it was the passing of my mom. And and particularly finding out that she had uh, Crohn's disease on top of diabetes uh, and wasn't taking care of her diabetes. Then uh, after that, we found out that her kidneys failed. And that's when I realized, okay, uh, we were in the hospital and I kind of bawled out the doctor. I like, not kind of, I went off on the doctor. I said, why is it that my mom is in the hospital now and her kidneys are so bad that she has to go on dialysis right away. The toxics was so bad in her, it was altering her personality. She became evil. Uh, she threatened the nurse and it was so bad that I had to literally stay the night with her. That's how bad she was. It was terrible. And so when I saw the doctor, I'm like, why is it that you didn't tell us that her kidneys was bad? Like, I'm all, and you should have did this, and you should have told us that. And why didn't you tell us? And he stopped dead in his tracks. If he could have turned his head all the way around, he would have. And he said, your mother knew for three years her kidneys were failing and did nothing. Yeah. Yep. He said she knew for three years and chose to do nothing. He said, and she is a client. I can't force her to do anything. Just like I couldn't force her to tell you about it. But for three years, my mom knew. And he wanted to do things that was going to help her. He mm -hmm. gave her all kinds of preventive measures. And my mom chose not to do anything about it. Yeah. Then is when after she died, I realized the effects of not going to the doctors and taking care of your health because I was one of them. Like I, I found time to make sure my children went, but I would never find time for me. I wasn't going. I wasn't taking care of me. And it really, really took a toll when she died. And I realized, nope, not this time. I made all my doctor's appointments and I found out that my heart was enlarged. I, um, they did everything they could. 
And to God be the glory, my heart went back down to size. It enlarged a little bit the last time they checked, but I went four years with my heart being back down to size. Mm -hmm. You know, but that was the day I said, no, you got to stop playing with your health. You know, so you, you said a, a few things in there that I think are important, right? Um, you, you talked about how um, your mother did know, right? But she didn't share that with your family, with you all. And I know there's a lot of stigma around families, why families don't speak. And I know a lot of times people say that it's, um, you know, it's black families. I think it's all families. I think most people... The, the, the parents don't want to tell their kids what they're going through or any of the issues that they're having. So you taking that step to tell your children and your grandchildren and for them to be aware of your health is, you know, um, mending that broken piece or breaking the chains. However, you know, folks like to use that metaphor. Um, can you talk to me about what that feeling was like knowing that your children now have that relationship with you so they know at the core this is what's going on you know with your health well it was important because again i'm standing there going off on the doctor i'm going off for something that she never told me and i was like mom i like when she got better i said why wouldn't you tell me you know why wouldn't you say something and her answer wasn't good enough I'm just going to be blunt. I didn't like the answer. And I told her it wasn't good enough. I was like, number one, you made me look straight foolish. I look like a plum fool yelling at this doctor who told me he told you about you a long time ago. So why? And she still couldn't give me an answer that was good enough. Like I couldn't, no matter what she said, the answer just was not good enough because we could have been helping her through the process. We could have been doing things as a family. And then on top of that, thank God we found out before she died because that would have been a part of our medical history that we didn't know. And so I was like, Mom, that's, that's just not good enough. How dare you take this away from me and I'm your caregiver? Like, that's not right. So I know the anger that I felt with my mother. I know I wasn't, and I'm telling y'all, I wasn't cute. I really wasn't cute about it. I literally went off on my mom. Like, I went completely off. And I, I said, you know, I'm not going to do that to my children. I'm not going to do that to my grains. I want them to know. So if mommy's not, my mom's not feeling well, then they understand why, you know? Um, and with my sons, again, this is a part of their medical history that needs to be told. And we do that black stigma in black families. And I get where it comes from. It comes from back in the times when, Black people didn't trust the doctors because back in those days, like psychologists, the psych that when a slave would want to want to run away, the psychologist that was white would let them know that they were crazy for wanting to leave their oppressor. So that stigma goes from generations to generations. So we know about the syphilis, like the outbreak, the Tuskegee experiment. That really wasn't that long ago. Exactly. And so doctors now, it's like they're saying, it's like, why am I going to go and be experimented on? I have a whole generation. My grandmother, it took her a long time to want to go to the doctors because of what they did to her brother, because he was one of them. And both of my grandmother brothers died early. It wasn't until later that we realized one died from the syphilis. You know, Vini, I'm really glad that you brought that up. Um, but we, I think we, all, all of us have to get to this point. If we have people of color who are our doctors, I would hope that there would be some sense of you can trust what they're saying, trust what they're recommending, trust what they're doing. 
Um, so with that being said, I mean, I, I'm, I'm having difficulty with recognizing still why some people won't go to a modern medicine. And I'm not saying that you just have to go to a regular traditional doctor, but I'm talking, there's plenty of information out now about herbology and general nutrition that people can go to on their own and find this information. I kind of feel as though it's, it's also a cop-out for some people to just throw their hands up and say, well, I'm not going to do this because of, of, of this or something that's in the past without having full understanding of what the current options are. Um, I say that because we both have uh, knowledge of um, Dr. Bonaparte and yes. the, the work that he's been doing for years and what he's been sharing with the, this region um, and serving you know, where he does. And so I, the, the stigma of, hey, I can't trust the doctor. Well, if they look like you, is that does that mean anything, you know, to some people? I don't know. But well, I'm, I'm I tell you, let, I, well, like with Dr. Bonaparte, Dr. Bonaparte said it took him years for the people in his own country to trust because of the fact that uh, some of them it is a cop out, but for a lot of these older people they still know the stigma. They still feel the stigma. They still they still have that, that thought in the back of their head, like these people aren't out to do what's right by me. And then with all these studies that are coming out that shows that there's a big gap in between people of color and, um, and our white counterparts when it comes to healthcare. And they can go, you can have a white woman that's less educated and an insurance is inferior to one of a black person or a Spanish person, and they will tend to get better care. And that is even a study that Dr. Bonaparte was a part of, right? They didn't even know he was a doctor. And when he went in along with another white guy that was a doctor also. They went in with the same symptoms. They treated Dr. Bonaparte less than they treated that white doctor. But then when the doctor found out that Dr. Bonaparte was actually in charge of him, then the whole story changed, right? Because now it's like, no, he was tired, he was this, but no, it wasn't. So unfortunately for us, we still have practices or people in practices that will do it. But this is what I say to that. Educate yourself about yourself. Educate yourself about yourself. I went to the doctors because I started seeing spots, right? And I'm like, my pressure must be up because I didn't see spots. So when I went to go find out about my pressure, my pressure was, uh, the bottom number was 92. I remember that. I don't remember what the top number was. And I told them that's high. And the doctor said, it's okay. I said, no, that's high for me. Even though I am a thick woman, I know my blood pressure is always normal. So anything in the 90s is extremely high. So I happened to be blessed with a doctor that listened that time. Because I had a doctor that didn't listen and I really had to go in on him. And then the, the, the head doctor came in and he said, let me tell you why she's correct. Because he kept telling me that I had high blood pressure and that's why I was on the blood pressure medicine. I'm like, no, it's only for my heart. I don't have consistent high blood pressure, but that's what made my doctor say, let's check this out. And she took all the tests unknown and the EKG, she only took it out just to rule out my heart. So that's why she took the EKG. But when she took it, she found out it was. Like they called me in the next day. Within two months, I had a defibrillator put in me because it said it was so damaged that my heart could stop at any second. 
That's so they did that very fast. But it all started because I knew my body. And so sometimes you're going to have to advocate for yourself. You're going to have to, if your doctor tell you, oh, no, I just want to put you on this blood pressure pill. You ask why. If they're giving you three and four blood pressure medicines, you ask them, what is this medicine for? And if you have a doctor that can't explain it to you, then that's not a doctor you need to stay to. You move on. Because there's more doctors inside of that chain. Stop taking medicine just because they're telling you to take it. And then remind them, again, you have to know your body and what you're taking. So there's certain allergy medicines I can't take because of the heart medicine, the uh, blood pressure medicine for the heart. So because I know that when the doctor gave me something for my allergies, the first thing I said was, will this interfere with my blood pressure medicine? And when he realized that he said, yes, this will. So let me prescribe you this. So you have to be an advocate for you. I'm not telling you to walk in blindly trusting anybody. But I am telling you to walk in with an open mind, but walk in being the advocate for yourself. Even with my five boys, like I'm such a medical mystery. Dr. Beatty is the best of the best. And um, I keep testing false positive for lupus. And Dr. Beatty said, I really don't know why. He was like, sweetheart, we've done every test I can think of. I've called my friends that are very, very good and nobody can figure out what is wrong with you. We don't know. We just know that your white blood cells are more than your red. They triple your red. We know that you're sensitive to touch. We know that you have a high inflammation level. Your water level is extremely high. He was like, I'm shocked that your heart didn't stay damaged because of how high your blood, your water level is. And they wanted me to retire because they can't understand. But what do I do? Every time I go to the doctors and I see a new one, I explain it all over again because it's important. So the one thing I say to that stigma, because we know that these studies are real that there is a large disparity between white and people of color when it comes down to health insurance. So we know this, but first of all, you be an advocate to you and hold the doctors accountable for what they're doing. Don't just take it because they said it. My godmother, and then, and then I'll let you jump in, my godmother, they had her on seven different blood pressure pills. My sister, my god sister, Audrey, all of y'all know her. Y'all all know her about my god sister, really, but Audrey, right? Um, she said, Vini, mommy got to take these medicines. And when I'm looking at these medications, I'm like, Audrey, these are seven different blood pressure medicines. There's no way in God's green earth or anybody else's that she ought to be on seven. And two of them do the same exact thing. I said, and one seemed to be counterproductive. Why? Because I took the time and I went into the medical thing and I looked up what that medicine was. When they went to the next doctor visit, my god sister walked in there with the authority that she had and said, y'all are going to do something about this because she's not taking all seven of these pills. So once Audrey was educated, we don't worry about mommy being educated. Because no, once we became educated and Audrey walked in there, she walked in there with the insurance. And now they're afraid of it. They, when they give her medication, not scared, afraid, but they now explain everything to her because she was dogmatic. Y'all are going to take her off and we're not leaving until y'all give her something that's going to be better. 
since they did that, her blood, because her blood pressure still stays sky high. I said that's because the medicine is counteracting itself. Now, her blood pressure is fine. She has lost weight. She has energy that she's never had before. And that was because we became the authority and stopped allowing her to take seven different blood pressure medicines. Absolutely. Well, Vinny, I think you nailed a bunch of different things there. And a couple of things I wanted to point out is uh, we have to be honest about the institutional racism and how that plays and how that's applicable to current day medicine. Um, just because someone is in a particular profession does not mean that their internal beliefs or um, ideologies are not going to come across in right. their profession. And uh, also remember, you know, people die all the time. And a lot of times those deaths are not investigated. Those deaths are just ruled as natural causes. And a lot of the times it could be something else. Just saying that that's what the truth and what the facts are. But we also have to make sure that we have to self-advocate, like you said. It's yes. super important for us to do that on our own. In addition to the self-advocacy, we have to do that for our loved ones and to yep. communicate with our loved ones about what is going on in our lives and have that secure information, just like we would for ourselves. So that yep. if something does happen, there's an audit of everything so that everyone who's involved as a family can make decisions together uniformly. And I also say that because at some point in time, I'd like to have this conversation extend to insurance. There are a lot of people who do yeah. not have health care, do not have health care, or they have a government or a muni supply program. You do have certain rights and benefits with that. Advocating may be different if you have that type of insurance as opposed to a private paid um, policy. But that's all questions that all of us should be encouraging each other and especially our loved ones to do. Know what advantages and benefits that you have on any policy. If you can get a policy, maybe there's a program where you don't have to pay as much as you think you do for an insurance policy that's going to be better than having nothing or what you already have. There is nothing wrong with asking questions, documenting those answers, and then sharing that with others. That's really how we build a better community for everyone. You know, Vini, I want you to touch on... Um... Can I touch on that real quick? Sure, sure. But I I also, in a short quick? amount of time, I also want you to, to talk a bit more about um, your communication with your children. Because I think there's a lot of folks um, who think, okay, well, my kids are too young or I shouldn't let them know, um, that's, that's grown folks kind of, no. We need to be more open and more candid with the, the youngest of our family just so that they know. But it has to be done age appropriately, I believe. Yes, and that's true. So let's real quick to, to talk about um, underinsured. I went to the clinic. I'm gonna tell you, when I found out about my health problems, I went to the clinic. And guess what? At the clinic, um, Capital Health Clinic, that's where they found all my issues. That's where they fixed all my issues. But it came because I was an advocate for me. And I didn't allow substandard care. You can receive the best care ever. Top-notch care. I received it from the clinic. And I'm, I'm not ashamed to say that. You know, even when I did go and get the healthcare through um, the state. I stayed with the clinic because that that care was very good. Um, so, but what you have to do for real is just advocate. If you are at the clinic, you, you are still afforded rights for good treatment. And that's what you, that's what you tell them. Okay. You make sure that you get the best. Now, my grandchildren, I'm going to even go down to my grands. They even know that if I'm very winded, they know to make me sit down. They understand. I took the time and let them feel the box on the side of me. So they understand that that is my mom's defibrillator. So if they ever see me shaking around, they're to call 911 instantly and not touch me. Because they understand that if they touch me, they can get bolted, which will hurt them. 
Like I, I remind them it's like taking your hand in a socket. I can electrocute you, so don't touch me. You call 911 and then you call your parents. So if that's why that's important. If something happens to you, they need to know what to do with you. They need to know what is wrong. And they and you nowadays they can trace the call in two minutes. So if they call 911, they got your instant location. But it's important for them to learn things like your address, your real name, not just my mom, right? It's, it's got to be, they know my grandmother's name is Evina Stansberry, right? Even Cam will say, or they call her Rini. Still didn't get the V yet, but, <laughs> but you know, and, and yeah. So, but it's important for you to make sure if they're three and over that they know their address and that they know everybody's name. And 911, they got to know. So you should sit down, you let them know. You might see grandma's heart beating fast. Or if you see me holding on to my chest, call your parents. Mm -hmm. Call 911. But you got to call your parents. And you can explain it to them. So everybody, from my children to my grandchildren, they understand what to do. That's it. And that's why I love you so much. We together are going to work to do whatever we can to build better community, starting with ourselves, starting with our families, our dearest ones, our neighbors, and letting it grow from there organically. Vini Stansberry, as always, the station manager of WING 1300. Thank you for a couple of minutes of your time. And there you have it, folks. Just another opportunity for you to hear some Love of the amazing you. things that are happening around this region and to hear some personal candid experiences. And together we can share this information, we can develop this information, we can help hold our legislative officials accountable, et cetera. Make sure you reach out to me on the website, jacquesreach.com. And until we speak again, remember, it's always about justice, peace, and humility.